So the idea of, of, of fusion, cognitive fusion, is where we imagine that we've, we've fused the world, reality, experience, whatever you want to call it, with our interpretations. And we basically imagine that the interpretations of reality equal reality. Okay. And the interpretations are many layered, aren't they? So we have, you could say the initial interpretation, something arises experientially and consciousness gives it a label, puts it in a category, a descriptive label, like that's joy, that's sorrow, that's fear, that's, that's the initial label. And then of course, there's the layers on top of that that can go on top of that of um, additional ways that it gets rendered, interpreted, made sense of, and everything from why is this happening to me? When is this going to end? This is a problem. Um, what's wrong with me for having this experience? How can I fix this experience? And so on and so forth. How can I avoid this experience? Those are all additional layers, right, of interpretation. Um, so, you know, for example, you're, you're, you're driving in the car and suddenly the traffic comes to a halt and we call that a traffic jam. So that's the initial label, the interpretation of that event. And then on top of that, we might layer like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm in a traffic jam again. I'm never going to get to work on time. Uh, the world's ending because I'm in a traffic jam. You know, those are all right, other layers of interpretation. So cognitive fusion, again, is imagining that my interpretations of reality are the same as reality. So if, 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 if you're my friend or my partner or my parent, I'm in relationship with you, and I have a whole host of ideas about who you are, my interpretations of you, my descriptors of you. You're this type of person. You think this way. You tend to show up in the world in this way. These are all my interpretations. And what can often happen in life is we, we are relating again to the interpretations as if they're reality. Like I'm relating to you, you as if you're my interpretation of you you're not <laughs> my interpretation. Um, and nor is anything actually equal to the interpretation of it. And that's the extraordinary thing to discover. And that's what psychology is referring to as cognitive diffusion, where you come to recognize that interpretations are just interpretations. They're not facts. They're not equal to reality. Sometimes Psychologists will refer to this as learning to look at thoughts rather than from thoughts. Um, so when we're looking at from the thinking, if you will, from the, the view of interpretation, it's as if we're, our interpretation is a pair of glasses and we're so fused with that view that we imagine that view is the truth. I mean, um, if you want to see quick evidence of cognitive fusion, just turn on cable news and listen to people debate about politics. People are totally fused with their interpretations or seemingly largely fused with them. They imagine that their interpretations are equal to reality. And they're not. They're interpretations. They're not. It's not as if the interpretations have no validity. Um, I, I'm not, I don't mean that at all. But what's going on here is always more than we think is going on here. It's always, the experience itself is always transcending the interpretation. So in my example of the person in our life, and we have all these interpretations and ideas and boxes that we put these people in that we know, including of course ourselves, because <laughs> we have all sorts of interpretations of what we are and who we are and what we're capable of and what our limitations are and our, on and on and on and on. And the, the thing itself, the experience itself, whether it's of another person, of ourselves, of the events of life, always transcends what we think it is. It's always more. It always um, is beyond the categories. The categories, the descriptions can't contain what's here. And because what's here is too vast, it's too, there's too much uh, information. You could say there's too much detail, there's too much complexity for it to ever be captured adequately in any of the interpretations. And 
this is the essence of, I mean, this last book that I wrote, this extraordinary moment is, is the, the whole book is really like a meditation on this basic idea of fusion and defusion of, of coming to see that what's here um, can't actually be interpreted. Not, not uh, comprehensively, not definitively. It is being interpreted um, to one extent or another. At least a lot of aspects of it are being interpreted. So how, how, how do we come to see, how do we essentially, um, well, let me say this first, that it's almost as if there's the event of this instant of this moment and then the interpretation of it that's sort of layered on top of it and as if it's as if it seems as if they're smeared together they're sort of fused together right and so the exploration that i invite is a is coming to see in which the ways in which they're not the same basically i was sitting on the couch just kind of before joining all of you and reflecting on what I might want to talk about. And I was looking at, I have my computer right now on this dining room table and I was looking at the table and I, I was noticing the way in which the, the, even the word table is an interpretation, right? Like what's actually here? Well, I could look at it and go, there's a thing called a table here, right? But if I actually feel, and this is, this is the simple way of diffusion as I see it, which is to feel what's here, to feel the presence of our experience. Because the experience of this thing that I'm calling a table that seems to be sitting here as a static object a thing that I have a word for, table. Oh yeah, it's a table. That's an interpretation. What's actually here experientially is, and as I sat on the couch, I just was appreciating this. My experience of the, the interpreted object, the table, is this absolutely dynamic, alive dance of light, and color and um, I mean, there's really no words for the experience of the th supposed thing that's sitting there like holding still, static, an object. The, the ex there's no way to really, of course, describe experience, which is what I was saying earlier. It's not describable. But seeing that our experience is transcending these labels which suggest many things. They suggest definability, they suggest stasis and continuity and um, division. And by looking at experience itself, feeling experience itself without having to get rid of the labels, but just noticing what it is that's being labeled, a table in this case that I was describing, you can begin to see and feel the way in which this is so inherently transcendental, every single aspect of it, including, of course, what you think of as yourself. Uh, let, me, let me read, um, apropos this, a, a passage from, um, from my, my last book. Oh, the light's terrible here. I think I can see it good enough, <laughs> barely. Um, there was a great Pink Floyd song, We Have Not Been Here Before. I don't know if that was the title of the song, but there was a, it was a lyric in the song, We Have Not Been Here Before. And the chapter is titled, We Have Not Been Here Before. Stolen from, from Pink Floyd. <laughs> but a very powerful thing to recognize that you've never been here before. And of course your interpretations would tell you that you have been. That's, 
there's there's almost an endless endless number of ways that we can come to defuse from thinking from our ordinary consensus reality interpretations but um so I'll, I'll read this chapter. The conventional view is that there's a kind of stasis or regularity to things and experiences, and that this stability defines our lives. Yeah, I'm sitting in my living room. Right? I, I, I've been here before. I've been in my living room. I, I'm here a lot, especially the last year. Um, but I've never been here before, actually, not experientially. We imagine that things are, for all intents and purposes, more or less the same from moment to moment. Right? But are they? That's the question. And our experience reveals to us in every instant that this is not the case, that things are not the same from moment to moment, despite what our conceptualizations of it in our language might suggest. This is how the world of experience and circumstance appears recognizable. Some mental emotional state arises and we recognize the pattern. It, it feels familiar. Oh yeah, I know what that is. It's, you fill in the blank, it's fear, it's joy, it's sorrow, it's ecstasy. Similarly, we see some object like my computer or the table we see some object or return to some place and recognize it more or less the same as more or less the same object or place that we'd previously visited. Oh, sure, that's my car or my house or my friend or the neighborhood I live in. That's the conceptualized world, the world of descriptions that we think we live in. But we don't actually live in that world. I mean, we do, but we don't. <laughs> paradoxically. I mean, from a pers one perspective, yeah, I, I live in the world of my descriptions and operate as if I do. That's part of the way life dances as that, but it's not the whole story. However true as it may seem that experiences, experiences and objects have a kind of persistence or continuity to them from moment to moment, that they are essentially what they were when we last encountered them. The fact is that they are not, at least not exactly. And this is an amazing, amazing, like, just to get that one thing, like it seems like this is the same room that I've been in countless times and the same computer screen and the same faces that I've looked at, at least some of them on the Zoom call but it's never exactly the same. Your friend or that emotion you're being visited by may look, feel, or behave in such a way that makes it seem recognizable to you. But the fact is that we've never actually experienced this moment before. Isn't that just amazing? <laughs> it's never looked quite like this. It's never felt quite, quite like this. The perception that's here. You know, I'm looking out my window and it's a scene I've seen many times before, but have never actually seen before. Not like this. The wind's never quite blown exactly this way. And the branches have never quite moved exactly this way. And the light has never been exactly like this. It's, it's very, the light is the way it is right now. And in the next instant, it's slightly different, even if subtly so, right? We've never actually experienced this moment before. Yes, experiences appear and feel very familiar to us. But true as that sense of familiarity may be, the reality is that we've never actually felt this particular moment, at least not in this exact way. 
No experience, no moment, no person, place, or thing is ever quite the same owing to its radically dynamic, non-static, alive nature. Imagine being transported to another world, a planet that's utterly foreign to you. Not a single thing about this extraterrestrial world could possibly be familiar or known to you because you've never actually seen, felt, touched, or tasted any part of it before. So it's a totally like a world you've never visited, right? Now, imagine your everyday experience to be this hypothetical foreign land. Whatever way you might conventionally describe what's happening, holding a glass of water in your hand, seeing a cloud-filled sky, hearing the sound of traffic on the street, feeling the wind upon your face, just go ahead and notice whatever is present here, traveling through this heretofore unseen world, exploring the remarkable experiential landscape that lies before you. This is this is the planet that you've never been on ever right now. It's absolutely um, like you're born anew in each instant. Both what is being seen and the apparent one seeing it, i.e. you, are reborn in every instant fresh, every instant absolutely new. Because everything is on the move. Everything is fluid, isn't it? Things are not holding still. The moment, the perception of this instant is a kind of appearance, we could say, a kind of arising, uh, a happening. And the very arising of it, the very appearing of the moment, which of course is instantaneously, I'm making it sound like it's this <laughs> slow appearance, but it's just boom, you know, just appears. But it's, it's not like the moment appears and then it kind of stays like <laughs> frozen. Like, there it is, fixed. No, it's not like that, is it? It's not frozen. It's moving. It's um, the, the birth of the moment is the passing of the moment simultaneously, right? Like, my words are spoken. They're birthed. And the, the arising and birthing of my words and, and the thoughts and the ideas and the concepts are, they're like, they're, they're being born and vanishing in the same single movement, aren't they? Since everything is new to you here, don't bother referring to any previously learned names or descriptors to make sense of what you're seeing because those categories no longer apply. You're literally in a different world now. So we, we act as if we have all these reference points, which is our knowledge, and that's how we're able to call all this stuff by the names that we call it. So from the perspective of my knowledge, I know what a ta this table is because I've seen it before, I've touched it before, I've had my computer on it before, I've eaten on it before, and then on and on and on. But the actual experience of it is, if I don't refer to the memory of it for a moment, and I'm just with it this, in this instant, I have no reference point actually to know what it is. It's, it's, I've never seen it before. I've never seen it. I've never seen it exactly like this. This is what I mean by getting very precise, very specific with, with your experience. Like what is, what is here actually? Not what you remembered was here a moment ago, but what's here right now? And what's here right now is completely new, completely fresh. Just behold the infinite detail, depth, and dimensionality that's here. Not one iota of which have you ever seen, nor will you ever see again. Let the truth of this sink in, this astounding fact that you cannot possibly know what this world is that you are experiencing right now for one simple reason. You've never actually been here before.
So just as you're sitting here, just feel the feel of the way in which your experience is not holding still. Notice that. That the, the perceiving of the instant is alive. It is fluid. It's like a, a constant opening into something else. It's curious because it seems as if we are able to enjoy experiences as if they're, as if there's a, uh, we could say, it, we, it seems as if we can enjoy the forms, the external forms, whether they're the, the objects of the natural world or the, or the man-made world human-made world, or the objects of experience. So a moment arises, a sound arises, a feeling arises, a felt sense arises, right? All, all these things, the forms that, yes, it seems as if they're here enough, there's enough continuity to them that I can enjoy this moment. I am enjoying this moment. So this is a very completely wild yet very powerful paradox that that this moment has no continuity to it it's it's like the disappearance is instantaneous the, the impermanence the slipping away is just like that right so this is what i mean like there's no reference point in a sense there's no forms because they never the moment seems to come into form but since the form is shape shifting is it a form it's not a fixed form. I've said this before, I was like, look at a cloud and you could say, well, yes, the cloud is a form, isn't it? But the, the, but the cloud doesn't just hang out and stay in a certain form, does it? Even if it's subtle, the cloud is sh shifting its shape, isn't it? So what is the form of the cloud? It has no form, does it? no fixed form. So this moment has no fixed form either. You have no fixed form, whatever you think of as yourself. Because what you were <laughs> a moment ago is something different now as, as a form, as a shape, as, a, um, as an appearance, as a perception. So the paradox that really is a wild one is that it certainly looks like the forms are holding still enough so that we can enjoy them, the ones that are so-called internal to us and external to us. But if we really look, we can see that the forms are, as the Buddhists would say, empty. Empty in the sense of having identity. You can't really identify the form because whatever you just identified is now gone. So how can you identify the form? Which is that, that's the saying in Buddhism that form is empty and emptiness is form. Well, that sounds, what do you mean? It's like, come on, you got to tell me it either has form or it's without form. It's got to be one or the other, <laughs> but it isn't that way. It's both and beyond both the formlessness of this, because it never quite takes a definite form, shows up as apparent forms, doesn't it? Just like each one of you, each one of us is an apparent form with a, a kind of seeming continuity to it, right? From moment to moment. But again, if we look, we come up empty handed, we can't find the form, we can't find the identity. So that's the paradox. I seem to know what things are, but if I actually look, I can't really know and define what they are, owing to their ever morphing dynamism, right? Everything that I've been saying, it, none of it is philosophy. It's our actual experience right now. <laughs> 
it's as, as it's, it's as concrete and non-abstract as anything could possibly be. It's the feeling of this moment, the feeling of this moment. Something's here, isn't it? There's a continuity to that presence. Something's always here, isn't it? And yet what's here is so clearly slipping away, slipping away, vanishing, vanishing, and yet always here. That's the formless dancing as apparent forms. And it's also, I mean, one of the really pragmatic, if you will, implications of this discovery of the ever liquefying nature of this <laughs> is that the notions that we have as humans of being caught in things and stuck in things is, what did I write? There's a, I saw this this morning, I was looking at this. For something to exist as a thing that we could be stuck in, there would have to be persistence, which direct investigation shows is not in fact the case. So if you imagine something, you're stuck in some situation or some circumstance or some thought stream or emotional whatever uh, event or history or whatever we imagine ourselves somehow caught in or troubled by or trying to navigate by noticing the impermanent nature of what's here. And it's not hard to notice that. It doesn't take 30 years sitting on a meditation cushion to discover this. Just look for one instant and see that the instant is no longer here. That's about how long it takes to discover impermanence, <laughs> right? It's showing itself constantly. <laughs> here it is, boom, gone. <laughs> so seeing that it's like, I just, I just read this wonderful thing from the Tibetan uh, teacher Longchenpa who writes very kind of poetically about a lot of the things I'm talking about. And Longchenpa says in, in the precious treasury of the way of abiding, there is no division between things arising and being freed. They converge in a single, single blissful expanse. No division between things arising and being freed. That's, that's what I'm talking about. The moment is liberated in the instant of its arising. The entire, your entire, <laughs> it's all let go of in the instant of its arising. And the world is made fresh and anew in every instant, literally. Isn't it? I mean, where is what we call the past? It's not here, is it? 